Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you, Steve, for that brilliant introduction. Um, as Steve mentioned, my name is Hannah Glass. I am a senior associate at King & Wood Mallisons. And today we are talking about, not exchange traded, um, we're actually talking about payments. Um, before we get into the discussion, I'd just like to invite everyone on the panel to introduce themselves, your name, where you're from, um, and what are you doing in this space? Just very, very briefly, because we will delve into that too. Starting with me? Okay, go. so... Uh, go for it. <laughs> Anthony Jones, so or AJ, I'm head of digital partnerships for, for Visa across Australia, New Zealand and the South Pacific. I'm originally from Wales, so you imagine how excited I am the first time in my lifetime to see Wales in a World Cup. But <laughs> not as excited as I am to talk about payments uh, here this afternoon. Effie. I'm Effie Dimitropoulos. I'm Executive General Manager at Navadi Payments, um, and I look after Transactions Group globally. Uh, and that includes everything from alternate payments, cross-border payments, China payments, and as, of course, um, you would have also heard of our recent launch of our AUDD stablecoin. Carl Mohan, General Manager for Crypto.com for the Asia-Pacific region. Just Carl Mohan, no KM, no KMJ, uh, no acronyms for me, unfortunately. Just Carl, over to you. Hi, everyone. Kate Cooper. I look after um, digital assets for National Australia Bank. No booing, please. Um, I can promise you there's an awful lot going on under the hood. Um, some of which I'm looking forward to talking about today, um, but come and find me uh, for a coffee afterwards and I can tell you a bit more one-to-one. -one. Sounds incredibly exciting. So as you probably worked out, this is probably a panel that would work really well at a finance conference. We've got banks, we've got payment companies, I myself technically sit in the banking and finance team. Just because it would be the most interesting panel at a finance conference doesn't mean it's the least interesting one here. <laughs> and that's because, as you probably have heard a few times today, we keep on talking about words like bought, invest, industry, economy. So payments are at the heart of all of that, which also means that they're probably at the heart of NFTs. So that's something which we will delve into as part of this panel. But I think we want to start with where NFTs came from, which is ultimately crypto, and at its very first instance, Bitcoin. So, Carl, we're going to start with you as the closest to the crypto industry on this panel. How is Bitcoin related to payments? Well, you know, the, the interesting thing is, I, in times like this, it's like, you know, reaching out to source documents, right? Going to the genesis of the industry is important, um, especially in times of doubt. And if you've anyone who hasn't read the paper and in crypto, I would encourage you to read Satoshi's paper. Now, the genesis of Bitcoin and crypto industry itself started off as a payment, right? Payment service. And if you read the, the, the paper itself, Bitcoin's mentioned twice. I think, uh, Hannah, you, you and I spoke about this. That it's mentioned yep. twice. But it's basically about payments you know the whole paper describes an electronic payment system that does not require intermediaries so without payments or the concept of payments you wouldn't have bitcoin without bitcoin we wouldn't have this industry today yeah it's pretty amazing if you think about so the the paper is actually entitled bitcoin an electronic peer-to-peer -peer cash system so it's all about payments and actually the first smart contracts what also payments because they were around escrow arrangements and multi-signatory payment arrangements kind of proofs in the name so if we started out with bitcoin in this world we're not really paying with bitcoin are we so how are we actually using this and effie i know what we've been speaking about some of the iterations in relation to stable coins so how do what are they how do they fit in um and sure. why, why do we need them if we've already got an electronic peer-to-peer -peer cash system? Absolutely. And I suppose if we go back to the fact that we're a fintech, and yes, okay, we're talking about stablecoin uh, today and we're talking about crypto in the last, you know, 10 years or whatever it might be, but companies like ours have been in uh, developing alternate payment rails for years outside of that traditional payment system to try to enable easier, faster um, payments uh, that don't rely necessarily on uh, banking or traditional um, uh, payment rails. 
So it all comes back to, um, you know, exactly that. How do we put the right tool, the right system in place for the right um, outcome? So in this case, we're talking about NFTs, which are digital assets. And so what's the best way to marry that all together is doing it with a digital payment on a set of digital rails that is all, you know, easily transferable, visible, um, immutable, all of those uh, all of those good words that we all like uh, when we're talking about blockchain. So that's that marriage of, you know, f you know the uh, financial side of things with uh, NFTs, for example. Yeah, it's, it's quite interesting when we talk about sort of interoperability, it's really about how do we bring the payment together with the actual use of the payment because it's just a, a means of consideration. It's part of, it's something that we need to do for the economy to work. So if we're looking at stable coins specifically, Kate, I'm going to throw to you here. What is a stable coin? Well, I think the one um, thing that we are public with amongst all the interesting stuff that's happening at NAB is we are in the process of launching our own stable coin. Um, and for us, um, you know, NFT definitely kind of speaks to the kind of retail end of the market. But one of the things that we're really interested in is how will our stable coin offering enable our wholesale um, environment. Um, we're focused on kind of high value, but really high friction use cases across the board for all of our work. And so we're looking at stable coin to be kind of the front runner for us in enabling a frictionless experience um, at the kind of bigger end of town, the corporate and institutional end of town in particular. So it's, it's quite use case based. We actually need the purpose of it um, and we need to link it to. But Effie, I know that you've also got a stable coin um, the AUDD, which has already launched, I believe? Yes, that's right. It launched actually, just funny enough, it launched one day and then the next day we also got approval for our banking licence. So that was... Uh, Congratulations. Thank you very much. <laughs> Uh, yeah, and so look, the stablecoin, um, you know, and I was recently on a panel uh, with the RBA and we were talking about, you know, the CBDCs and stablecoins and what's the use case and who should be doing it. Um, and, you know, we've all read the papers and how Phil Lowe is basically saying, yeah, look, fintechs are the people who should be doing um, stablecoins or retail-based uh, stablecoin products. Um, and we're all in this room and, you know, every single one of us can categorically, to a T, say, payments in Australia are fairly easy. In Australia, between Australians, in, between Australian businesses, really quite easy. It, it, it becomes a lot harder when you start talking about cross-border payments, payments international, payments where you have to, you know, take a few steps, hop a few rails, um, you know, get a few beneficiary banks, and then you know, pay a a lot of fees, I'll <laughs> be nice in this panel, um, and that's where it starts becoming a lot more interesting. So we are in the international space, many fintechs are, a lot of Australian businesses especially, you know, the last couple of years have moved into that international space and that's where we see that stable coins um, make a difference. I also want to bring it back to the fact that just the terminology, it's a stable coin, right? And so, you know, on the previous panel we talked about how do you bring, you know, my mum and my dad and my cousins and my brothers and my sisters into this space? Yes, one of them can be brand, but the other one is understanding what a, what a digital asset can be and that it can be stable. So people are familiar with one dollar equals one dollar. They're not as familiar with one dollar equals point zero zero, you know, stroops, whatever, you, you know, any other terminology. So. Bringing that language into the payment space is going to help um, use case and help uh, get that um, better usage across um, across the industry and across uh, the population. Yeah, I think I think you're right. And by the way, when we're talking about stable coins, what we're really talking about is something that exists on a um, in this case a blockchain-based ecosystem in terms of the underlying technology, but it is stable, meaning the value is the same as something, some other assets. So um, the ones we've been talking about here are Australian dollars. There are others out there which are US dollars. Um, there are some that are even backed by commodities such as gold. We're not going to get into discussions around the accounting behind all of this because um, there are different mechanisms, but it's, it's important to think about different stable coins might actually be quite different because we've also got ones which are called algorithmic stable coins which may not be as stable. So whole lot of things out there. Um, but going into sort of the international space, AJ, obviously you've been doing a heap with Visa. How does this all fit together with what you do as an international payments provider? Yeah, it's a good, good question, Hannah, and I'm sure a lot of people are wondering why, why Visa is here. And so it kind of just clarify the fact that we enable commerce. 
whether that's m-commerce, e-commerce, in-store or in the metaverse, our, our whole purpose of being is to allow consumers and businesses to make purchases quickly and seamlessly across, across um, barriers and across boundaries and across borders and also domestic payments. So that, that is our real focus. So making it easy and simple to make those transactions. So the core work that we do with crypto exchanges and brokerages is that onboarding or on-ramping of funds into the exchange. We then want consumers to be able to buy whatever they want, to be quite honest. Uh, it's their, their money, it's their funds. We enable the movement of fiat currencies onto an exchange. And in the case of the likes of Crypto.com, we also do in, in reverse, which is to have that on, off-ramping onto a Visa card so you can go to Woolies and Coles and your favorite grocer and make a transaction with fiat currency across the Visa network, but based off the holdings that you've got in your crypto wallets, whether it be Bitcoin or ETH or Solana or whatever. So that's our focus, it's the enablement of commerce, um, no matter where it, where it happens. And I think that's a beautiful idea because ultimately, we're not just talking about this from an altruistic perspective, this is an industry. And if you can't pay for things, well, that can't be an industry in the world in which we reside. But you touched upon the partnership with crypto.com, so Carl, back to you. How's it all been going with the Visa card and um, interaction with consumers in this kind of new world? Absolutely fantastic. I mean, we, we, we love the partnership with He really Lisa. has to say that. I have to, here. right? Um, look, we, we've been really proud of the, the Crypto.com Visa card. You know, we were one of the early pioneers. We continue to explore the utilization of the card. It is one of the biggest crypto-backed Visa card programs on the planet, and we're continuing to grow it further and deepen the relationship with Visa. But, you know, I, I think, Hannah, I, I want to throw the span in the woodworks a little bit because, you know, Go I like making it. trouble. <laughs> you know, we got a crowd of people oh from, uh, you know, come here to hear about NFT. And, you know, I know, um, you know, when Steve talked about what the hell's payments got to do with NFT, right? And, you know, ultimately, if you think about the Visa card that you hold in your pocket, or if you have a different branded card in your pocket, we shall not be named. Um, or on your phone. Because Visa is in the room, right? <laughs> uh, because there's only one exchange as well, by the way, is crypto.com. Uh, if you've got any other exchanges here, don't mention the names either. Um, the, the, the thing is, the whole thing about the card, technically the card itself is an NFT, right? If you look at the 16 digits that you key into your e-commerce platform when you key in, that's an NFT. What does it mean? It is not replaceable. It's linked to you, and you own it, and it's unique to you, right? So the moment someone steals that number, suddenly they get to perform a whole bunch of transactions for you. Uh, now, where, where I see the future heading is two parts, right? Especially in the payments with regards to NFT, is the conversion of a... The, the entire concept of the Visa card that is so ubiquitous today in the metaverse, uh, how, do we, how do we enable payments in the metaverse, right? If we believe, and in this room, I hope the majority of you believe in the metaverse, otherwise you wouldn't be in a conference like this, is how do you enable commerce to occur in the metaverse seamlessly? Because there's not one metaverse today, Hannah. There's multiple metaverses today. And how do you seamlessly interact as a consumer? Because Sure as hell, I don't want 15 different cards that I'm paying in different uh, metaverses. I want one to pay, that's one. Number two, the, the card itself is an identity, right? Now, if you ask me where I think the future is heading around the NFT space, it's going to be around the concept of you know, soulbound tokens. I'm, I'm really bullish on soulbound tokens. Uh, it's a very you know, nascent concept. Um, and Just I think explain what soulbound tokens are for so, the audience. So again, you know, a lot of, we, we love, you know, especially when, when you have a very young, intelligent guy like Vitalik throwing uh, concepts always uh, assigned with games. And the whole concept of soulbound tokens is there's certain games you could only earn certain items, and that's, that item sticks with you forever, right? You, you can't trade it, right? And the reason why you can't trade it is because you don't want to reduce the gameplay. You don't want to diminish the fun of playing a game. So there's some degree of effort. And once you own it, you own it, right? So when, when we talk about our interactions in the real world today, whether it's our driver's license, our visa card, and all of that, it is us and it belongs to us. And when we produce this as an evidence in the real world, people go, oh, 
It is called. It is not KMJ. It's not SPF. Oh, sorry. That name shall not be mentioned either. Uh, you shall not it know. could be. It could be me, right? And I, I think I think that's where it's heading. So maybe you know I'll pass on to my other panels because I, I'm very passionate about this because I think that's the future. I think Carl um, and AJ. I think actually you're beautifully representing what I see as the future of this sec sector, which is bringing together TradFi and DeFi. And I know the DeFi enthusiasts out there will be like, oh, never, that's not what this is about. But I think that we're going to enter a period, um, maybe for the next five years, where actually the two have a role to play together. And if we're talking about ubiquity, not just you know across the retail space, but across business, um, and across kind of institutional um, game. I think that TradFi has got a really important role to play in helping be a safe pair of hands to educate um, and support um, all of those customers to participate. Because ultimately, you know, certainly from our perspective, we are, we are all in. We really do see that, you know, blockchain represents the future of finance and you know, in many in many cases, from from transparency to frictionless experience, you know that that promise is there and in the future, but it isn't probably here today. And so, the role that certainly we want to play, and it sounds like Visa wants to play, is well, how do we actually push ahead from a customer experience perspective, really, really broadly, um, and make you know finance and financial freedom available to all. And I think bringing it back to payments. Um, payments, you know, was the, the kind of first cab off the rank in terms of fintech um, development and really the big disruption. Um, and so I think it would be natural for that to be a big facilitative part of this space as well. I think that's a great point, right? Because unless we're all NBA players that get paid in Bitcoin, I'm imagining that most of the people in this room are paid in fiat currency. They're paid in Aussie dollar. Maybe some of you are paid in USD. But we're paid in the currency, a fiat currency, and we need to be able to spend in that currency. And if you want to convert that into a different asset type, then you should be able to do that. And that's essentially our message, is that bridge between traditional finance and DeFi, if you want to partake in DeFi. Then, of course, you've got the overlay of how uh, blockchain technology could be used in a CBDC environment. And we are seeing significant approaches from governments across the globe in the way in which they use a CBDC rather than using traditional financial electronic payment methods. Um, and then, of course, the stable coins that we mentioned before. Although, for me, the definition of stable coin starts with the word stable. So that, that <laughs> differentiation between algorithmic versus treasury-backed and how it's treasury-backed is incredibly important. That is certainly a fundamental concept. I think if you go back to some of the more conservative people writing on this subject, i.e. the Bank of International Settlements, they're pretty clear that for it to be stable, you actually need a stable asset, and algorithms are not stable. Um, but I think you've drawn up on a really interesting point, which is we're talking about stable coins, we're talking about metaverse, which is, of course, this interaction between and convergence between our physical and our digital selves. Um, we're talking about interoperability. But then you mentioned central bank digital currencies, and this came up in the previous panel too. There are currently about um, there are over 100 different central bank digital currency uh, projects, of which there are 19 of the 20 G20 countries have those projects going on at the moment. Australia is one of them. And I'm going to throw, first off, I'm going to go to Kate, because NAB has been involved in one of those, at least, being Project Atom. So do you want to give us a bit of a rundown of what the RBA was doing there and kind of how that works. Yeah, so I think, you know, from a Project Atom perspective, it was very much kind of starting to dip, dip all of our respective toes in the water to CBDCs. Um, and I think, you know, a lot was learned. I think with the um, more recent announcement around the pilot that the RBA is going to be running, um, I think that that has the opportunity to take us on to an another level, actually. Um, and the use cases are spanning, you know, right from a broad spectrum from the kind of corporate and institutional end that I've mentioned, but also right through to retail. And, you know, you know, my view, this is a personal view, is you can absolutely see relevant use cases from a CBDC perspective um, at the big end of town. I think once you get to the retail end of town, it's going to be an interesting journey um, around how those are deployed and how those are used. But I'm, you know, I'm very um, enthused to 
see the progress that's being made. Frankly, I'd like to see it being made faster. Um, but obviously, you know, we're operating within, you know, constraints, certainly from a regulatory perception, if not regulation being in place. Um, and I think that, um, you know, as early 2023 um, comes about, we'll start to see some of those use cases being announced um, and some really interesting and diverse pieces of activity that take us far beyond, um, you know, kind of the, the starting point that Atom represented. Question? Sure. Who, who yes yeah, so who who wants to take that one because i think you know that's the ultimate like dystopia and that's one of the reasons why our perspective is you know whilst we're looking at the full spectrum we're really interested in focusing at the, at the kind of bigger end of town where it isn't about big brother controlling mum and dad and their bank account and switching off access to their money uh, in a in a heartbeat because they happen to have spoken out against the government or something like that um, and so how do you avoid that? I don't know. Let's watch and see what happens elsewhere in the world. I, 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 can I? Can <laughs> yeah, I was about to go. Let's go to Carl. I can't contain myself now. <laughs> we can tell. Oh. You are like literally um, on the edge of your seat. <laughs> I, as a migrant to this country, right, the thing I love about Australia is the freedom that has bestowed upon us, right? And we take it for granted. A lot of us take it for granted, the ability to go out there and have our privacy respected. Uh, I, I feel strongly about uh, retail CBDC, and I think it's a bad move. That's my view. Uh, it's personal, not my company, not anything. And, and the reason being is, the today, if I have $50 in my pocket, I could go and spend that, and no one knows I spent it, right? And that is what our economy is built upon, what our society is built upon. Now, if you, if you say it's wholesale back CBDC between banks, Go for your life and do whatever you want. But when it comes to retail, I think it is critical that we defend our privacy in this country. And um, I, I, I cannot see it happening. I, I really can't. We, we, the, the other thing as well is when it comes for retail payments, a lot of our payment infrastructure is so resilient and robust enough to cater for our retail consumer needs, whether it's through the payment networks today, right? Um, you know, during, during COVID the last three years, payment utilization, every one of us learned to tap and pay. Every one of us, not only tap and pay, you know, whether it's e-com, you know, even my, my parents knew how to go out there and use QR code and pay for their goods and services, right? So you go like, do we need a token to actually do something magical? I don't think so. Uh, you know, one, one argument would be programmable money, but then I go, well, we can do that through the networks today, Visa Network or, you know, an alternative payment or even NPP. I think what you're identifying is that there needs to be a real problem to solve. And, and obviously, CBDCs can solve certain problems in certain markets. If they don't have a real-time payment network, it's really good at making instant fund movement. Um, if you want financial inclusion, it is another way of promoting financial inclusion. Uh, if you're looking, if it's very expensive to move funds, notes and coins around a country, then again it solves those problems. We saw that with the sand dollar in the Bahamas. You've got an archipelago, thousands of islands. Moving notes and coins is extremely difficult, particularly when hurricanes come through and destroy the infrastructure. So CBDCs in certain environments, retail CBDCs, have a real part to play. I think in markets where you already have real-time payment network, and you have a robust, extensive electronic payment uh, provision, as you said, Effie, as we do in Australia, then you have to look very closely at what those use cases are for retail CBDC. And maybe it is programmable money. Um, maybe it is to ensure that black economy and grey economy starts to disappear out of Australia. Maybe that's another way of doing it. And as a taxpayer, you might be really interested in the fact that it could lead to more tax collection and less tax evasion. Um, so, so those are kind of the use cases that, that we can see for retail CBDC. Uh, I think we're still considering what that might look like for Australia, but for many markets around the globe, Visa is helping uh, central banks to develop out their CBDC policy and linking it back to tra TradFi, so our traditional network of merchants and accepting payment terminals and so forth.
It's, I mean, obviously we could probably talk about CBDCs alone for hours. Um, just before we wrap up, um, if, if I'm gonna give you the last word. If we're having this conversation in a year's time, what will we be talking about? Uh, a greater familiarity and a more, um, uh, a more visibility of stablecoin usage and crypto and digital asset usage in the mainstream. And I think, um, I'm hoping that the regulation, you know, really catches up as soon as possible because players like all of us um, on here, you know, we are compliance first, licensing first, regulatory first. We're all building our uh, ecosystems in such a way that will protect consumers, will protect businesses. We want to do the right thing by everybody. And I think that will become very apparent as soon as the regulation comes in. And I think um, they're, they're, you know, sitting here in a year's time, we're going to be seeing a lot more people utilising digital assets and probably, you know, my brother and sister and those kind of people. That is wonderful. Thank you so much. I mean, clearly we have a world where money does make the world go around. What form that money takes can make met, tend to take many different forms, whether it be stable coins, CBDCs, cards, um, or Bitcoin. Um, whether you're in the metaverse, whether you're in IRL, thank you so much, everyone. There's clearly a lot of work that's happening, not just visibly, but also under the hood. And can't wait to hear where we're at in a year's time. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.